Hello. Right. Yes, I'm going to give a brief uh, talk about Minnow and its API and how you can get data out of it, and uh, then talk a little bit about file formats as well. So first, Minnow API. Uh, so the UI we have for Minnow uses our API, but it's also available uh, to you as a gRPC uh, set of files. Uh, gRPC is a framework from Google to uh, communicate over the network, uh, which uses Protobuf, another uh, framework from Google. Um, we use Python uh, and wrap this framework from Google in a hopefully nice to use Python library. Uh, so you can query what's going on with your sequencer. You can uh, display data as it's displayed in the user interface. Uh, and you can start sequencing runs uh, all through this API. Um, you could use any language you like. Uh, gRPC comes with support for uh, Ruby, C Sharp, C++, uh, lots of other languages. Um, you're going to have to use gRPC raw and not use the tools we provide, but you, you could use any language you like, and customers definitely are, so uh, it's, it's up to you and what you want to do. Um, so Minnow's API is structured into several uh, sections, and it's uh, hierarchically structured. We start with a manager interface, or what we call the manager interface. This API lets you query information about the sequencing positions on your device. So for example, if you were to query on a gridiron, you'd get information about five sequencing positions. Uh, in newer Minnow, I think this is going out in 5.1, you can get some top level information about uh, what is going on with those positions. So you can see, or you will be able to see in the slide there, um, uh, one has stopped some kind of out of range temperature maybe error, and three are running sequencing right now. Um, so this API lets you query what positions you've got available to you. Once you've selected a position and you know what you want, uh, what you want to connect to, uh, the API lets you connect to that sequencing position and uh, query more information. Again, if you're not using our Python wrapper here, uh, you, what you're doing internally is uh, disconnecting from the main manager and you're connecting to a different endpoint on the sequencer to talk to that individual position. Um, but using the Python API, it's very transparent. You kind of say, oh, I'd like to have uh, X1, for example, and it just returns you a new object that is internally talking to that different port. Um, so once you're connected, you can query more um, position-specific information. For example, you could get product codes back from connected flow cells, query temperatures on connected flow cells, um, flow cell IDs, this sort of thing. Again, what's being displayed here is all coming via that API, uh, the type of the position connected uh, as well. Um, so that's all good, but you probably want some more information than that. Uh, what I'm going to talk about more specifically today is querying information about protocols you have run. Um, you could start sequencing runs here. You could um, uh, do other things with the API, but I'm going to focus on that. Uh, querying uh, sequencing information. So for example, here we've got a protocol displayed in the user interface. Um, to clarify what I mean by protocol, uh, a sequencing run uh, as, as a, it's displayed in the user interface, we refer to as a protocol at the API level. Um, the protocol contains a Python script, which is in charge of organizing the sequencing for the run. Um, and their lifetimes are tied together. So when uh, you identify a protocol you're interested in, uh, which you can do by uh, querying back all the list and um, interrogating based on attributes you've got there. So for example, you could select based on sample ID, you could select based on the flow ID, or the uh, runtime and when it was started. Um, you can then query back various extra bits about that protocol. So. Um, to talk a little bit more about protocols. Um, they're tied to a Python script. As you start a protocol internally, Minnow kicks off a Python script. Um, that Python script runs. It does your sequencing. It does MUX scans. It pulls data through your pores. Um, when the Python script ends, say, for example, you've got a bit of data left to base call, uh, the protocol enters a new phase, uh, starts catch up, and um, we wait for all the bits and pieces your protocol has started going to finish until the protocol then eventually ends off. Um, so all the times you can see here are available via the Python API. Um, 
the type of sequence script you were running, uh, information about configuration, and uh, the settings you use to start your run, uh, again, flow cell ID, that kind of thing is all recorded and stored in your protocol. Um, a quick note on acquisitions, which is what we internally call the kind of process of pulling data off the sequencer. There's several in this bar below. Um, when you're running a sequencing run, we start and stop several acquisitions. We use the first few to calibrate and organize the device. They're not interesting for sequencing, so the one you'd be interesting in is the long one at the end, uh, which in the API is marked up as a sequencing run. It's kind of flagged as having interesting data. Um, so that's when you want to query. Um, so once you've identified an acquisition period that you're interested in, which is part of a protocol, you can then pull out much more um, detailed information about the sequencing run. So for example, uh, available immediately is things like uh, the alignment reference and Q-score settings, um, various yield information. Um, but additionally, you can query back the chart data that we render in the user interface. So um, there is a separate API which allows you to say, I'm interested in the read length histogram. Um, I would like bins of width 10,000 bases. Um, I'm interested in splitting by end reason. And the API will then stream that data back to you, give you a long list of various fields uh, that you could render into your own histogram if you like. Um, equally, there's the, all the other graphs um, are available with various splitting and filtering uh, parameters for you to query. A lot of that is rendered in the user interface. There are a few extra bits that the UI doesn't make use of that you could pull back as well if you wanted. Um, so to summarize, um, the API is hierarchical. Uh, we've got a lot of examples available. Um, yeah, right, file formats. Um, so Stu mentioned yesterday, we're moving away from HDF. Uh, it is a great format for typed but somewhat unstructured data. Uh, and our signal format for a long time now has been relatively well defined. So we are moving towards a different format that gives us other benefits. Um, so community members, as Stu mentioned yesterday, Garvin and uh, the Slow5 Blow5 group have done a great job demonstrating how good uh, you could be with a new file format. Um, there were some extra bits we wanted to uh, get in our format, um, which involve right performance. So with various things we're doing internally, we want to uh, reduce the load on the box used by serializing data to disk. So um, we have put a lot of work into the format on its way to disk and how we can make that as optimal as possible. Um, the way we've structured it, we can stream data coming off the sequencer into the file, and um, even at the point the read isn't yet complete. So we can write a chunk of data, compress it, put it on disk, um, and later decide, oh, that read is um, complete now. I'll sign it off and put it in the, uh, the file for real. And what that means is we can store fewer um, pieces of data in either intermediate file formats or in memory. Um, and it means, say, you again had um, a run that was not fully base called, and you decided to stop your run. At the moment, Mino has to transcribe all that data from disk in an intermediate file format into your output file format. Um, now, it will be in the output file format on disk already, so we can just move that file, uh, release it to you, and there'll be a significantly, significant reduction in time there on uh, writing. Um, so a note on how we've done that, yeah, there's two separate sections. We've got a read section, which is metadata about the read. The signal information uh, link is linked back to in a separate table. So all of the information about, say, start times or um, <coughs> uh, your run IDs, um, uh, other metadata fields about your reads are all in a block at the end of the file, which is um, very close together, so it's quicker to read if you want to, say, query bits about information about that read. Um, right, so what are we using? We're using Arrow. Um, it's a columnar data structure, which means um, all of the fields are stored contiguously. So for example, read IDs are stored contiguously in the file. If you want to filter on read ID, 
you read a contiguous block of memory, you have all the read IDs suddenly available to you, and you can go through and filter that without having to step through each record in the file and load individual bits out of those records. Um, so it's really quick for querying. Um, it's also great for writing. Um, and as a note, it is integrated now into Dorado and Benito. All right, thank you. <laughs>